Cool, cool. So now we we will go. We were on case. We stopped at case five. Let's see if I can make this big screen. Mm -mm -mm. One thing that you're awesome about is I, I when I'm doing the study group. Sometimes medical students tend to be very quiet, and I'm glad that. I know what I know, and I'm gonna, you know, teach y'all some things. And I'm gonna ask questions, and I love that. So keep that up because, like I said, this group is for trainees, and we can all learn from each other. Okay, so let's e go. E even the rule of fours. <laughs> even the rule of fours. Like I'm, you're gonna help me so much with localization. I'm gonna be a localization queen after this. Then I think Gabriella posted underneath. Whenever you get a chance, when we're talking about the. Uh, left uh, frontal I, I I yeah frontal eye movements and oh so helpful it, it made it made sense now okay yeah the frontal eye yeah so I thought that was see it's like were we on case five or did we finish case five I can't remember let me let's see the uh, vignette here you know I don't recall this case okay Cool, let's do it. Equation. Yeah, let's do this one. Awesome. Okay, let's do it. So 66 year old man lives in a rural community, has sudden onset aphasia and dysarthria witnessed by his daughter. So where do you, where does that localize? Uh, so left frontal, left, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm gonna kind of, left side for sure. Yep. Cause like um, you have like the Broca area, speech, the lobe, and then like, yep. Temporal. Werne Keys is in that temporal region. Yeah. Awesome. So now we're thinking left side, if this patient is right-handed, cause most of the, the population is right-handed. He, EMS comes to the scene of 15, recognizes on a stroke. Okay. Gets transferred to a comprehensive stroke center. NIH is three. But patient deteriorates to 22. Oh, that's not good. Ooh, but I'm yeah. thinking eat some, yeah, something, something's not good. Maybe there's like maybe a bleed going on or edema or swelling going from a three to a 22 within 15 minutes. It's definitely not good. So patient yeah. arrives to this, to the uh, center on Saturday, one hour and 37 minutes from symptom onset. Good. So he's still within the window for TPA. On exam, he has global aphasia, who says that's left side, right homonymous hemianopsia. So that would be on the left occipital. So still on the left side. Oh, well, that left gaze preference came back. So <laughs> did he just like wipe out his whole left side? Yeah, yeah. A uh, right sided hemoplegia. I wish they would have said arm or leg, but either way, yeah. So you have occipital, temple, parietal, and. Temple. Probably frontal if it includes the um, the leg. Patient was rapidly transported to CT for advanced imaging. CT was normal given TPA door needle time of 17. Ooh, okay, so they did it. So they did T uh, head CT and now they chose to do CT perfusion. I May guess. I just Go ahead. Global aphasia, when when that term is used, that means both Broca's and Wernicke's. I just want to clarify. So expressive yeah. and receptive. Okay, exactly. so in that, in, in that case, then we would infer that there is both frontal and temporal lobe involvement. And then, of course, like you were saying, the, the hemianopsia, meaning also occipital lobe there. So. Yeah. Okay. And like you called it, he pretty much stroked out his entire left um, yeah. hemisphere. So let's see, CT perfusion shows large region of hypoperfusion in the left MCA distribution. Let me get out my pen. Well, you can, you can see that uh, with that corresponding hypodensity on CT. So why do you, what do you think they, why do you think they mentioned the hypodensity on CT? If he had hypodense region on CT, what would that mean? Oh, like without corresponding, meaning like no bleed, is that? Yeah, so you're right. So yeah, you're right in that bleeds are hyperdense. Sometimes when people are having a stroke, like an acute stroke, you'll get a CT and you'll see a hypodense region that's 
that that can be significant for like are you t when, when they say does that mean like dark if it's darkened does that mean is that the term not like so would would that mean like also like no like old bleed then like any chronic bleed is that what you're stating or going with that let me um so for c So the most hypodense region is black, and that's going to be air. So you have hypodense air, and then the most hyperdense on the CT is bone. Everything else is in between relative. If it's really dark, then we say hypodense. If it's really bright, we say hyperdense, because bone is hyperdense, mm -hmm. air is hypodense. So when you have someone with a stroke, so here, Normally, your tissue is supposed to look like what we see on the left side of the brain, you know, very kind of grainy, grayish. You see some really good white matter differentiation here. But if you look on the right side of this person's brain, you see how it's not, it's darker. Let me get my, I love drawing. You see how it's darker? Right, yeah, do. Yeah. And it's like closer to the ventricles. The ventricles. The yeah, which is fluid. Yeah. So there's this is hypodense, and strokes can present hypodense. We'll turn the hypodense regions on a CT scan. Mm. So that's what they're talking about here. And so why would the it's in an acute set in an acute situation, why would it present in a hypodense versus a hyperdense? Because in an acute situation, would or could you suggest that this would be like vasogenic edema going on so quickly, or like I'm just kind of curious, you know, in an acute situation, why would a um, great question? Let me see if I can find a good image that shows uh, early signs of. Okay, here this might help us. So you see how they're pointing out the hypodense regions. And as you yeah. cut through, you see some hypodensity and right. some swelling. So I'm trying to see if we can find a good sign. Radiology is its own like field where it's like it's it's no, it's, it takes it's, it it's, takes practice. I'm still <laughs> trying to I'm still trying to learn it as well. It takes practice. So, and this is all resident level stuff. So the fact that you are learning this right now, you're going to be like, net, like two years ahead of your time. <laughs> so what happens with a stroke, you know, as the blood has reduced flow to the brain, um, you know, oxygen, you start to get like, you know, brain neuronal death. And then that manifests itself, you know, differently on a CT. So I'm, like ischemia then is what you're saying like it's not quite infarct it's ischemia or so here or... so you can see here that on a mission maybe maybe there there's very minimal changes on ct and then over time the neuron you know the more death more, more brain yeah mm -hmm. neuronal loss and death and gliosis all that takes place and then that manifests itself on um, imaging as like cell loss cell death it's starting to eat away, you know, undergo apoptosis. So eventually you're not gonna have any neurons there. So then that space is pretty much just gonna be dead debris, dead tissue. So it's gonna get darker. So on the mission, it wasn't too bad, but then within a day you start to see some, you know, hypodense regions here. And then within two days, you really see how the area is not the same as here. Yeah. It's losing its integrity. It's becoming darker. The cells are dying off. And then eventually over time, within months, it's just going to be, you know, a darker space. Could you also assume that like in that particular area as you, on the right side of the brain where you circled, like you see how you don't have like the beautiful like foci and gyri, like that there's also edema going on with that sort of apoptosis or um, yeah. happening. Okay. Okay. Really? So for there's different kinds of edema there's vasogenic edema and then there's cytotoxic edema and for tumors you have a, like a vasogenic edema whereas for stroke 
it's cytotoxic edema. So like cytotoxic. I said, you know, we're losing the gyrite cell psi um, oh, granularity because the t it's there's swelling, there is injury, and there is cell death. Right, right. I'm trying to see if there's anything else helpful on here. Nope, that's it. Makes sense? Yeah, yeah. So in this particular case, the hyperdensity would be, would be um, the sort of definition of that and this acute sort of, is, we've defined it as an ischemic stroke. Um, then this would be like equivalent to like that ischemia, that cytotoxic. Yes. Um, cell death. Okay, yep. fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Awesome. Great question. So now they do a CT perfusion. I guess, I, I don't know why they do, the, do it in this case. I mean, it, well, his NIH show sales 22. If they were thinking mechanical thrombectomy, how much penumbra is saved? Is there any penumbra at all? CT head doesn't show any areas of hypodensity, which means that there could be some brain to save. So maybe that's why they went ahead and did the CT perfusion. And I think also my suspicion is his the evolution of his his symptoms were so drastic within 15 minutes that um, I think the suspicion is like, wow, there's a serious transformation happening very quickly. Like what we need to gather some more information and uh, being that is we jump from three, which is, I mean, people walk around with an NIH three all the time, but 22 is severely disabled. We're looking at, oh boy, we can't, we, we need to know all of our options here and what are we dealing with? So, um, but interestingly enough, I wonder how quickly they did the CTP considering, remember that we looked at those guidelines yesterday and it was like, oh, between the six to 24 hour window is when you right. will do the CTP. But again, I think it's the evolution of his, brain attack that I think people jump quickly and we're like, yeah. what are we doing? Like what's happening? No, yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great point. That's a really great point. So then we go, so then they do a CTP, then they do um, cerebral angiogram and looks like they were, oh, looks like they were able to remove the clot. So for blood vessel practice, what's this blood vessel? ICA. Fantastic. That is the only one I can really pick out. <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah. That might be, is that, that might be like ACA, maybe MCA, that little big chunk. Of, well, oh, that's a tough one. Oh, look, they tell us now, interior, posterior view. That's awesome. Oh, okay. But that still doesn't really help me. Lateral view, pre-thrombectomy procedure. That still really doesn't help me. Um, and then I like your word of spaghettis. We see some spaghettis. <laughs> so this is probably MCA or internal carotid. And then all this here is uh, well, MCA. I think we certainly can say though, even though I'm clearly not, uh, I am in an extreme novice at reading this type of imaging. I can certainly say though, with slight confidence that this is a very proximal um, occlusion. Would oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, we're, yes. We're very, like, yep. I, yeah, this okay. is definitely very proximal. Let's since Which is why he's all wiped out. Okay. Let's see, middle cerebral artery. Here we go. So here's a good image. So we have the internal carotids. Um, and then ACA is coming out here. And then we have the MCA. So yeah, so he probably had a clot early on in the proximal segment before it branches into like the M2, M1, M3 segment. Yeah, good. good Can you up. actually, sorry, I'm, I just, cause I'm in, you know, of course at the student level, it's just like, is it MCA, ACA or PCA or Badler? So, but once you get into your level, it's like, oh, there's M1, M2, M3. I'm like, okay, so where do those divisions occur? So M1 is, so the, the one means more proximal, assumingly? Or... Yeah, that's a good question. Let me, that's a good question. Let me find a better uh, image that maybe shows, branches it out better. 
Oh, here's a great one. Okay. Okay, perfect. So the oh, M- I see. So the M1 segment, like you said, is very proximal. After the A, um, the ACA branches off, then you have the MCA or M1 branch. And then after you pass the basal ganglia, you get more lateral. Then we call it M2. And then it looks like the M3, M4, this is actually a good image, I need to save this. The M3, <laughs> I'll send it in the chat. The M3, M4 is more like the cortical. And sometimes if it gets, if the clot is too far distal, they won't go for it because it's- it can't even get there, yeah. yeah. And then the, the concern is you may break off the clot. If you can't completely get all of it, you may cause it to break off even more and send out more clot and cause more um, stroke symptoms. So this is a really good image. I'm a, uh, let's see. Yeah, I like that. I'm gonna put this in the chat. Awesome. So, and then let's try and figure out what we were seeing. This looks like a lateral view. Let's see. Oh, where to go? Download this. Oh, come on. Let me download. Ah, oh, sorry. I'm trying to download this so that we can see it. Okay, so now, okay, this is a lateral view. Okay, awesome. So, let me get out my keypad. Oh, and it's, it's labeled. I love that. Okay. Yeah, I'll put this in the link too. So, this is the internal cat, or yeah, internal carotid. And then, work number two, you don't really need to worry oh. about this. This is a yeah. board question from a neurology. At the neurology level, they love asking, "What's the first branch off the internal carotid?" And it's I could have sworn I thought it was the ophthalmic artery the whole time. Well, I guess it's not. Isn't it? Yeah. I guess it's the meningeal hypophyseal trunk. Good to know. Yeah, because there's a lot of like you know, um, stroke, you know, like little rec, um, strokes to the eye where people have like that monoocular you know vision loss. So I'm I'm just yep. you know we constantly hear that you know and so I just automatically thought like oh like first branch but I guess not yeah and actually that it didn't click for me until you just mentioned that amorosis fugae is like a warning sign for a stroke and and now the anatomy makes sense because it's the first yeah. branch off the ICA or, or second rather but either way <laughs> right because the men, meningeal fit but yeah so you're so correct that yeah it, it, it makes it makes sense so yeah yeah like that those TIAs and the amorosis fugae yeah Yep. Yeah. And then the, so then all this is going to be the MCA. Oh, it doesn't really tell. Let's see where we can find the ACA. Temporal, temporal. Oh, I guess we don't see it in this view. Do you see it? No, I don't. Okay, um, well, that's good. So then if we go back here. <laughs> put this link in the chat. And I'll put all these links in the, um, underneath the YouTube video so that people can always go back and refer to it. So if we go back here. So this, that means I would see the ICA and the MCA then, right? Yeah, yep, that's all we're seeing. So this is yeah, lateral, so I, this is probably the ICA and then up here is the middle and all this is a bunch of other stuff that we don't really need to know about at this level. Cool. So, so we're then, so then we're, could, could we agree that this is like an M1 occlusion then or? Definitely. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Definitely. Very proximal. Cause like it, it there's nothing, there is no spaghettis. <laughs> so then let me clear this. And then we can go on. 
case five continued. Oh, that's so gross. Gross, 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 gross. That's why I didn't go into surgery. I don't like, I don't like gross pathology. <laughs> okay, so upon arrival, he goes to the uh, intensive. This is your, your area now. He goes into intensive neuro ICU. Patient experiences dramatic improvement with only mild aphasia, right facial weakness, 24 hours post treatment. Fantastic. Uh, his NIH stroke scale was two. Beautiful. Okay. On hospital day okay. three, diagnosed with nuance at AFib. Now we know why he had the stroke. So here's the tricky part. We learned that ANA, there was like this big discussion with should we restart? Um, or when when should we restart anticoagulation for for patients with AFib that now have a stroke? And it, it, I still am not clear because there were some physicians on the side of you know like no and some on yes. But I, I you know I don't remember, remember those plenary plenary controversies. I wonder I don't have my papers on me anymore um, here, but. There's this big thing with the AFib anticoagulation. Oh, you know what? I mean, I stand incorrect, actually. I'm sorry, that was in regards to um, hemorrhagic strokes. My apologies. No, no, no. You you brought up a great point. One, two, it's the same with ischemic because if you start anticoagulation too soon and someone who had a huge stroke, you increase mm -hmm. the risk of hemorrhagic Bleeding. transformation. So okay. I'm trying. So I'm trying to pull up, I actually listened to a lecture talking about how to, the, you know, how to work through when to restart anticoagulation on a patient. So I'm just trying to go through my notes to see if I can uh, pull it up uh, for you so we can discuss it. Because, um, no, that's a great question. Let's see. So... And then, I mean, I'm actually just looking at the Chad's VASP score too now, just to see what to do with this, with this guy. <laughs> Say that again? And then I, I'm just kind of looking now like at the Chad VASP score, I guess, um, mm -hmm. in regards to this patient. Yeah, he, yeah. I mean, he, he, his, would be, his would be extremely high. Yeah. He gets what, he gets a two, four stroke. Uh, we can do the, MD calc to figure out the rest. Definitely a two for sure, two for stroke. Um, I don't think we actually have that much history on him, unfortunately. We have pretty much just have age and like the stroke. I don't know. I don't recall anything else. Uh, did he have, these are very limited vignettes, you know? So we don't know if he's like a diabetic or not, or like, right. you know what I mean? Or any of like yeah. the past, if he had CHF or not. So, and, um, and I don't know if we can apply the Chad's vest to him because we have to look and see who they apply the Chad's vest to. Well, no, I guess we can because what does it apply to him given that he, his, the etiology of his stroke is AFib. Mm. Wow. Well, so Maybe the interesting thing is it says new onset AFib, new onset as in like on arrival in the ER when he got an EKG, he has AFib or as in like he developed AFib post surgery post thrombectomy does that make you know what I mean um so I'm kind of curious is this a cardioembolic situation or because this just randomly said nuance that they said like just yeah. at the very end so I'm like when was this on arrival of the ER we recognized he was an in AFib or randomly inpatient on the last day of hospitalization he randomly jumped into AFib yeah I'm wondering it could it could be all scenarios <laughs> let's, let's, see, yeah. let's see what the MCHAD says. Score designed to identify patients high risk. Ah, oh, can't remember. But it, yeah, it, yeah, his he. Let's do the calculator. So, how old is he? We can uh, do what we know. I think it was less than sixty-five. But I'm not sure now. When I think about, it. let's go back. Yeah. Nice. He's close. Oh, sixty-six. Like, 66. And wait, no. let's see what history. See, there's no history really here. Yeah. yeah so well, let's see this what is we can be... score him. So he's he's male. We don't know this. He has a stroke. And yeah, he's uh, art. well, the th th isn't it two and above? You automatically qualify for Coumadin. Yeah. Yeah. So there isn't you go. Isn't that the magical? Because under under three, it's aspirin. 
So let's next steps do they talk about? So recommend zero low risk, one low to moderate, antiplatelet or anticoagulant, score two or greater moderately high, anticoagulant. Yeah. So he would automatically, no matter, we don't even know the rest of his history, he automatically qualifies yeah. for Coumadin. Now yeah. the question then is, what, how quickly do you start the Coumadin? Exactly. You so know? let me, hey. let me um, I'm going to go to YouTube because there's that, that guy that I like listening to. Uh, what was his name? Uh, what was his name? This guy. So he actually did a presentation on this topic. And I'm going to try and find his slide because I thought I um, saved it, but I may not. But he actually does a an, look, anticoagulation after stroke. So I'm going to send this to you. Okay. So let me. So he basically just kind of walk you do like different case scenarios and how to determine whether or not, how to determine timing. You know, interestingly, old school, when I was sort of, so, when I had worked in your IC, I know for sure it was to be no, like no blood thinners, no antiplate, no nothing for 48 hours, post right. TPA. Yep. So I don't know what, again, one thing about neuro that's so beautiful, like it's constantly evolving and, I, we're we're like learning so much more every single day so yeah you're right and so here some of the questions you want to ask yourself when you want to think about does this person need anticoagulation is how big is the stroke because the bigger the stroke the more likely it is that they're going to have hemorrhagic transformation so you um you look at how big the stroke was you want to uh look to see do they have any evidence of bleeding already so to look how big the stroke is or stroke severity you get the DWI sequence to look for any evidence of hemorrhagic transformation. You can get like the GRE or the SWAN, which are just different kinds of neuroimaging that shows blood products. Actually, let me let him explain it because he does it so well. And here's our final algorithm. If you have an atrial fibrillation patient with signs of acute ischemic stroke, first- Can you hear it? Stroke care, yeah. Randomized control trials are coming soon to help answer this important clinical question. 
and to put the four larger trials into a table. These trials will include several thousand patients each, with strokes of various severities and varied anticoagulation time. And we expect data in about one to two years. And that's all. He's phenomenal. Like I, I listened to all of his lectures. And did I put this in the chat? Oh, let's see. If not, I'll just put it in again. I don't believe you have. So yeah, that'd be great. Actually, there is a YouTube one. I'm not sure if that's the same one. So potentially, that's yeah, a, you have, you have, you have, yeah. So now when you're on service, you can be like, well, it depends on how big the stroke is. And if there's bleed on CT, they'd be like, okay, neurologist. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know, I think his, now I understand why his was started at day four because he didn't have a bleed, but it was a large, it was like this one third of the, area i believe uh -huh. is that what was that was that the qualifier for for day four start i believe yeah his, like if it's, if, his, it's, if it's like less than one third then you can look at other things if it's more than one third it's like mm, it might be too big may want to wait a little bit longer but size and evidence of bleeds, bleeds on yeah yeah two things that you yeah. want to you, you want to look at that's a great question so it looks like for him it, does, does it so they started it yeah day four yeah day four and if his was again remember his was he wiped out his whole left side so yeah. his was clearly but no evidence of that no evidence of bleed just wiped out the whole left side that yeah that was his deal so i mean and, you sense. know you know these are these are fictional cases so but if we if this was our patient in the hospital we would definitely want to get number one repeat imaging to see the evolution of symptoms definitely get an mri to further characterize the stroke look at the dwi to look to see how severe it is get the gre or the swan um scans to see if there's any evidence of bleed how's the patient doing and the dwi will help us determine the size so given that they started him on um, warfarin means that he probably had us even though his NI stroke scare was huge. He probably had a lot of collaterals and penumbra to where he wouldn't have any. Um, As we saw in cases yesterday, that you can have a huge, you can have a huge stroke, but not have any findings on DWI, because once you have findings on DWI, it means that, okay, this is dead. This is pretty much dead tissue. So he probably, he did have a huge stroke. They removed the clot on time, probably had little evidence on DWI and DWI seems for restricted weighted imaging. And that's the sequence that we use. It's a type of MRI scan. That's the sequence you use to determine if someone had a stroke or not. So if we don't see little white patches on, let me just pull this one up. And white is dead tissue in a DWI? Or? So white is areas of restricted diffusion. So what DWI is, it's basically looking at like water, mo water I'm not a physicist, but water molecules bouncing around and like healthy tissue takes, absorbs water. Dead tissue versus, does not take in water. So what's going on is that it's able to figure out, you know, the water passing and it shows what areas of the brain is allowing water to pass and what areas of the brain are not. So if it lights up white or bright, that means that these areas are restricting. They're not allowing water to get through because they're, they're, they're dead. So they don't have like a mm -hmm. plasma membrane and they can't do osmosis right. and the gradient is shot. So if it restricts on DWI, it's dead tissue. And so for this gentleman, he probably didn't have a lot of restricted diffusion on DWI, which is why this stroke was probably small, even though his symptoms were huge. His, the tissue that actually died is so small because they were able to go and retrieve the clot so that they could save a lot of the tissue that would have died 
had they not retrieved the clock? Is my guess. Make sense? Yeah, and and good for him for also coming, um, you know, activating EMS so quickly, you know, yeah. to be able to get both pharmaceutical and surgical, um, you know, care. So. Yeah, that's why it's so important. And that's one of my areas that I want to do and stroke is really do a lot of more outreach and people recognizing stroke symptoms because, you know, many times patients will, oh, look, they do show us the DW. Is this it? Well, look at that. This is DWI. I see. So he's just got a little baby in part. Yeah, though. he does. Lucky, lucky person. And they call it embolic because of how it looks. Um, so he's just throwing off clocks probably out of his heart so that's why he just needs to be anticoagulated and that's why they were able to give it to him so soon because he has like tiny tiny strokes yeah cool that was a good case and then time so, so i guess we can assume that he came in to the er with afeb new onset versus yeah like first, it, 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 it would have just been nice to have that in the initial vignette, you know? <laughs> so, but yeah, I agree. So now, yeah. Oh, cardio embolic, there you go. Easy. <laughs> awesome. And um, so, ooh, large vessel occlusion cases. So there are many different etiologies of stroke. One is cardio embolic, which is pretty much the heart. Second has to do a large I vessel disease in the internal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's take a look at this case. You wanna you wanna take this case? Sure. Um, so we are in case six. So 62 year old male with ACID on warfarin presented with sudden onset left sided weakness. So I'm thinking like right localized in the right area there. INR is 1.4. So I believe that is is that therapeutic? No wait, is that sub therapeutic? Yes. Sub? Because I believe it's. For AFib, it doesn't have to be 1.5 to 2 is goal. Yeah, so for AFib, it's 2 to 3. Let's look this up. I want to say 2 to 3 or is it 2 point? Oh, why did, why did I think that's valve 2 to 3? But, ooh, this is Looks a good smart. Google question. <laughs> I love Google. What would I do without Google? Okay, 2 to two 3. To three. Yeah. So then what's valve? Just out of curiosity now, the okay. inner range for valve. For valves, so this is a good board quest, step three question. For valves, if you have a mechanical valve, the goal is usually 2.5 to 3.5 because they, mechanical <laughs> mitral valves love to clot like crazy. So they have to increase good the INR know. goal. Okay. okay, good to know. Okay, so he's definitely sub, we know what we're getting into now. So he's yep. definitely sub therapeutic. Very nice, okay. And then so for everything to, else, it's two to three. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. They love that I question need, on step three. <laughs> step two, they love it. I think I actually had it on my step three. Okay, cool. So, cool, cool, cool. Awesome. We've identified he's subtherapeutic on his human So notified EMS, um, Cincinnati um, stroke scale was positive, brought directly to the comprehensive stroke center. NIH of 22 for right MCA syndrome, which explains his left-sided weakness. Um, Non-contrast CT with no early infarct changes, no hemorrhage, so he would, at that point, now we're, he's slightly eligible for CPA. I don't know what the last no normal is though, but Alberta stroke program early CT score of 10, CTA with right M1 cutoff. Okay, so quite proximal there. He received alteplase, okay. So with a dorsal needle of 45, 90 minutes after symptom onset. Okay, fair enough. So he, he, he got a CTA. Awesome. So what do you see here? Oh, we see, so, this is very proximal too. Yeah, yeah so one. one thing I like to tell, um, teach students, and I, I, this is how I was taught by a stroke doc, when you're reading scans to look like a superstar, you first want to tell us, so look, if we're reading figure one, you want to tell us, is this a CT? Is this an MRI? This is the CT scan. What is it? Is it up the nose, you know, the, the brain, the neck? What, what part? So you would say, this is a CT head. Um, is it with or without contrast? More than likely, 99% of the time, 
CT without. without. So this is a CT head mm -hmm. without contrast. What cut is it? Is it axial? Is it coronal? Is it sagittal? This is an axial. So right there, when you're presenting, you can say, if you're sometimes attendees will have like the image up on the computer and they ask you, okay, read this. And if you say, this is a CT head without contrast, axial cut, mm -hmm. they're going to be like, <laughs> and Thank it you. gives you time. I had a consultant attending tell me it gives you time to think about what the image is, you know, kind of orient yourself. Out. So the big thing that you're going to be wanting to look for on a CT head is is there bleed, no bleed. And like we said, bone is hyperdense, air is hypodense. So mm -hmm. are this are are the certain regions that are hyper hypo correctly hyper hypo. So if I see a white area inside the brain, then I'm like, okay, is that normal or is that not normal? Most times um, there's certain regions that, and I don't wanna get too advanced. There are certain regions in the, in the brain that are hyper dense, like the penile gland and the core plexus. But that's really, you'll typically see that in the ventricles. But I think big picture is, Hyperdent in the brain more likely means blood. And that's pretty much all you're looking for on CT. CT, is there blood? Yes, no. I think right. at, at your level, that's all you need to know. Blood, yes, no. Is it bright? Then it's gonna be blood, more than likely. So we, we don't see anything abnormal on figure one. So then you would read it as, this is CT head without contrast of the brain, Axial cut, no evidence of acute intracranial hemorrhage. Boom, you just read a CT scan. Now, the right panel is a different mm -hmm. image. So, and you. yeah, so how, so if we were presenting this on rounds, how would you read it? This is a CT angiogram um, axial view. Yep. Is this the neck or head? Oh, um, this is head. Okay. Is it, yeah, good. So CTA angio head um, axial cut highlighting occlusion of what artery is this? Um, MCA. Yep, proximal MCA. Proximal MCA. What side is it? Uh, the right. Very good. You just read a CTA angiogram. Awesome. And they talk here about aspect score. And I so the aspect score, they don't use it as much now that we have CT perfusions, but the aspect score is really just um, a way to look for evidence of infarct on CT. So if we see hypodense regions on CT, there's certain areas that we give scores to. So the highest score is 10, meaning that the brain is normal, but Okay. If we see hypodense regions in the basal ganglia or like in the M1, now M1, M2, M3, those do not correlate with the M1, M2, M3 anatomy wise. Mm. It's completely different because like M4, M5, M6, they're just areas in the, uh, in the cortex. So if any of these regions are dark, then what we do is we go to MD calc, or MD calc, MD calc, um, and we give it a, we give the person a score. Do you use like, that um, at your um, hospital, the aspect score? Do you use that or? Not really. I mean, not, not really, not really because we have CT perfusion. Okay. Um, so basically what this is, if you see areas of hypodensity, you say yes, yes. And then it gives you a score and it just kind of predicts the morbidity of the patient. And this is used sometimes for, um, is this patient a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy? If their aspect score, depending on the hospital algorithm, is less than five, then they would say, okay, they're not a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy or not a candidate for TPA. But because we most times do CT perfusions, a lot of this isn't used as much, but this is, this is what that was referring to. 
Awesome. So we looked at this. Okay. So we've got the patient taken for endovascular therapy where angioplasty confirmed the right M1 as we both suspected here. He underwent thrombectomy with combination use of a stent retriever and intraarterial alteplase. Um, Follow-up Im imaging showed minimal infarct burden. Nice. Um, the patient had an excellent clinical outcome. He left the hospital with an NIH of zero, completely functionally independent. Wow. Awesome. He came from an NIH. He was his initial NIH was what, 22 or yeah. No, it was are we getting our patients confused? Was he a no, that was the other patient. This patient oh. had an NIH. Yeah, you're right. Good call. Had an NIH of 22. Yep. Nice. And we they found the clot, they took it out. He got a uh, Tika of three, which means complete revascularization. Imaging shows multiple or minimal infarct burden. Beautiful. So looking at figure 3B there, sorry. So we have, I see the big juicy internal, the figure 3B. Um, so we have the ICA. I'm trying to see, I guess the, and then the MCA is the most left. Like, is that the MCA or no, is that the, yeah, I guess it has to be because that's actually where the occlusion was, MCA. So we have the ICA, is that the MCA then where you continued on with the, with your purple drawing? Yes, I would say that that's the MCA, but only, I, only, I think- Only because the arrow is yeah, pointing. I, I think this is the right MCA and this might be the left. Oh, and then you got the two ACs coming up. Can you see those? Yeah, yeah. That... and then and then you see that A A com A com that A com there. Yeah, that, okay. That's my guess. That's my guess. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good you're question. So, you're so taught. <laughs> that's my guess. <laughs> that's my guess. Oh. And I wish they would. I wish they would tell us what view this is, so we can go and look it up. But I feel like the eyes are towards like the back. Like the eyes are. I don't know how to explain. Like towards the back. Um. Or. Um. um like that. That's like the back of the head, and then going front is like. Yeah. Well, I'm, oh, know. like here. I'm guessing. Yeah. Like. I'm, yeah. I'm like. Something. <laughs> it's a weird view. I, I don't know. It's a weird view. But at least, at least we know that this is the ICA and this is the MCA. Confidently. Yeah, right? <laughs> Confidently. Everything else, I'm like, what? could be making other stuff up. Awesome. So now we get to case seven. Take it away. So um, case seven, 56-year-old man with hypertension presented to a primary stroke center with acute onset right-sided weakness and inability to talk. So I'm already thinking in my head, we've got some localization to the left um, hemisphere, particularly of note with the aphasia and, um, or inability to talk, that would be, yeah, that would be expressive. So I'm thinking like left left frontal sort of area, left parietal. Um, so, and I said 23, that's interesting considering that's literally all is, this is only symptoms, right? Because hmm. mm -hmm. we just said, just right so we can say, okay. And then you take 23 on presentation consistent with a large left MCA syndrome. Okay. Non contrast head CT showed a dense left MCA. When they say dense, is that what you were talking about with like the, the dark area? Like, I guess, what is that? I would think that? like um, hyper dense MCA sign where you see like a hyper dense, like the MCA is highlighted. Let's look, let's see. Is you see that? Like, so they call this the hyperdense MCA sign. Okay. So that okay. means that there is, it can correlate with a clot in the MCA. Because, okay. so like, so you know how it looks, it looks brighter than normal? It, it does, and it's not equal to the other side. Like it, if you look at the, it's not symmetrical to the right hemisphere, so. Exactly. It's, so sometimes if you have a really thick clot in the in the blood vessels, it can highlight and look hyperdense on imaging. So they call this the hyperdense MCA sign, and it fits with his uh, his symptoms. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, so it showed that left uh, that dense left MCA without early infarct changes, aspects of 10. Um, he received also placed with a door to needle time of 27 minutes. So very quick here, 54 minutes from symptom onset. So, um, and then here they're highlighting, uh, like, you know, with this aspect score that he gets a 10 because there's no changes. We don't see any hypodense regions in any of these regions that would be scored. Awesome, nice job. So he's transferred. Um, so uh, Drip and Shipper here um, activated to uh, a comprehensive stroke center, given suspicion for large vessel syndrome. Um, CTA head obtained at the primary stroke center while waiting for transfer showed a proximal left M2 cutoff. So here we have M1. And then this would be M2. And you see you don't have any spaghettis coming out. And you can also see this is on, uh, what is this? Corona, this is- Coronal view. view. Yeah. And yeah. usually you would have a lot of flow. And here's an here's a interesting question. So why do you think that past the area of obstruction, he still has distal flow in his MCAs? So would he have some collaterals? Like, I don't yeah. know if this is true, but like also like there's, you've got some ex, like vertebrals yep. and PCA yep. and kind of- oh, just, he's, he's got some collaterals. has collaterals from the other branches that are mm -hmm. allowing him to still maintain blood flow to the distal um, MCA territories, even though he has a proximal occlusion. Yep, nice. Nice job. So now, here we go. So he's, so he's taken to the Andrew suite on arrival at the Comprehensive Stroke Center, proximal left ICA stenosis, um, and 3A is seen here. Okay. And left M2 cutoff visualized. Thrombectomy achieved recanalization of the left MCA. I wonder what, how much stenosis he had in the carotid. You know, like 70% yeah. like 70, 70 is like that magical number to do like a, carot, uh, a CEA, yep. um, I, like at least from testing standpoint. Yep. But, if he's symptom, but, even, but if he's symptomatic, it, it wouldn't matter if it was 70% or not, right? Ooh, it, it's no, like, if you're symptomatic, I, if, you're, if you're symptomatic, like really no question. matter what, we're gonna, we're gonna do a CEA. Uh, instead of just medical management, like with, uh, you know, with the, um, like statins and, and antiplatelet therapy. You are right. Let's see. Let's see what my hospital has to say about it. <laughs> I probably won't go into detail. Um, I think a lot of these are written for patients. Let's look at, uh, see what public, oh, this is Lanzi. This, wow, this came out of Mayo Clinic. So Dr. Lanzino is a neurosurgeon. Dr. Robinstein is a neuro ICU doc and an intensivist here. Huh, well, I'll right. be, there we go. Let's see what they have to say. So I'm just trying to look for a chart. Okay, symptomatic carotid, prompt feedback, blah, 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 blah. Scoring. So they do an A, B, C, D. Hmm. Okay, let's first start with asymptomatic carotids. Hypertension, blah, 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 blah. So we have the, we have the lipid lowering that is preferential statin. Um, course managing their comorbid illnesses yeah so you're right about that but that i'm trying to look for the percentage give me some numbers okay here we go current interactive should be strongly considered for patients with symptom for symptomatic patients with 70 to 99 so even if oh should be strongly but also, considered but, 
but then look at the next sentence there. So even if it's less than 70, if they're symptomatic, oh. it should also be considered. So even though we don't know how much stenosis, he's symptomatic, we're doing a CEA. Right. Right? Oh, we should at least consider it, you know? And or at least consider, yeah. sure. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm gonna send this paper to you and I'm gonna save it for myself. Because here's another thing I've learned um, as a resident. If you can quote, you can be like, well, according to so and so and this, so and so, this is the recommendation. They're going to be like, what? Okay, go right ahead. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay, yeah, thanks. I'll learn something new today. So if they're symptomatic, 50 to 69 should be considered, 70 to 99 should be strongly considered. Now let's look to see if they're asymptomatic. What's the... That's when you do the lipid lowering. So the statins and the managing the comorbid. And I believe that article did bring up that right here, right here. Yeah. So the lipid in that third paragraph, lipid lowering mm. or goal, goal of cholesterol less than 100, smoking cessation, you know, all that lifestyle stuff. At, let me see nice. patients with, and then aspirin, I believe. Yeah, so it should be true, correct. So aspirin and statin is like the medical management. And, then, and so, cool. I, so even if they're 80%, if they're asymptomatic, then you just do, uh, you just do, um, what's this, medical management? Is that what, is that what we're saying? You know, I don't, I can't answer that question, actually. That is good to know. Huh. What, what do you do if they're asymptomatic and 80%? I don't know. Hmm. The but then it would be interesting to say, are they really actually asymptomatic? Good point. Yeah. So like, let's, let's, they... let's say they, let's, with confidence, let's say that they are asymptomatic. Management of extra parenthood. Let's see what this says here. Degree. I'm just looking for a table. Yeah, that is definitely gray area though, because it's like, you know, still manifested. Oh, so check this out. So they did randomized controlled trials in patients with 60 to 99% stenosis who were asymptomatic. And those, and they found that the benefit of carotid revascularization did not increase with more severe stages of stenosis. Mm -hmm. This is in contrast to symptomatic trials. I see. So the asymptomatic patients are Really, basically, it's not until they become symptomatic, then at that point, we need to consider either stent versus CEA, which I, if I'm mistaken, I believe CEA is actually a superior to stent because also stent reocclusion rates and, ah. um, and stuff like that. Now, I don't have an article to quote that. <laughs> no, I believe you. I believe you. That's the important intensive. Okay, so looks like if it's asymptomatic, no matter how high it is or how stenos how occluded it is we watch if it's symptomatic if it's greater than what was it 70 70 no. is the magical number 70 oh, and above but then 50 here they're to saying 50, 59. 50 to 69 50, so if it's greater than symptomatic 50, think about it if it's greater than 70 highly consider it yeah okay cool 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 I'll do some more reading and see if I can find anything more on the asymptomatic. Cause I wish they had a table. There's, it, it, I oh, here, check this out. Who have less than 50, okay, here we go. Patients who was symptomatic, asymptomatic internal carotid who have less than 50% stenosis do not require revascularization. But like you said, they should be screened for risk factors. Fantastic. Now, what if they're 50 to 60 for patients with asymptomatic carotid who have 50 to 69%, we suggest intensive medical therapy and follow-up. 
Okay. Well, what does that intent? What does intensive mean? You know? Oh, there's a chart. See intensive medical therapy. So I'm like, are you just making it like the highest level statin at this point? Because there's tiers to the statin. Yeah, are just you... like making sure that we're aggressively monitoring their blood pressures, their diabetes. Okay. Making sure we're just like being more like, no, you can't. You know what I mean? Just yeah, be okay. more um, t- I'm more on top of it. Okay, fair enough. And then let's look at this 70 to 99% medic for medically stable patients with asymptomatic carotid who have a life expectancy of at least five years and have a severe internal carotid, okay, either medical therapy or medical therapy plus carotid. Okay, it's reasonable. Okay, so if they're asymptomatic and you know they otherwise in good condition, we can send them to the neurovascular surgeons and then they can think about it. Mm. Yeah. And I guess it goes back to like, if, just if you want to bring it to simple, just real quick, black and white, it's like asymptomatic, asymptomatic medical therapy, symptomatic, surg- more surgical, you know, approach, you know, especially when we're talking 50 and above or, or 70 and above. So that makes, that makes sense. Okay. And there's some wiggle, there's some wiggle room, room for discretion, you know. Yeah. Patient specific. Where did that go? Where did that go? I'm gonna take a screenshot of this. Why did we? Mm. Sorry, one second. I'm going to take a screenshot of this. Put this in my stroke notes. Cool. Then I, let me make sure I put this in the chat. Awesome. And I sent this in the chat already. So I'll copy this. Awesome. So for this gentleman, he had got to go with the clot and then they're probably cool. So once they know he's symptomatic, so they're probably going to consider stenting or CEA if they don't stent him in there while they're removing that clot. Cool. So. Looks like they did do a CEA. So uncomplicated clot and direct me hospital day number three. Oh, he underwent carotid arterectomy. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> and then discharged at an NIH zero. So very nice. Nice, 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 nice. Yeah. Awesome. Last case. So 85 year old female with AFib, off anticoagulation. You see that all the time. Sudden onset, left sided weakness and confusion. Left sided weakness, we're thinking the right side, confusion. Hmm, who knows why she's confused. Hopefully she's not bleeding. So we think in right side, NIH shows feels 19, non-CT shows aspect of nine with early changes in the basal ganglia. So you can see, if you see, let me put up my, oh, here it is. Wow, that's a tough one to see. She... Yeah, I, I would not have seen that, but. Wow. It looks. <laughs> Doesn't look as 
granular on uh, what side? Yeah. Loss of the right compared to the left. Okay. Yes. Yeah, what yeah, what about would. that? So what about like even the internal capsule? No? Am I? I feel like there's a sure. little bit change of the, yeah. Yeah. Like. Yeah. This is the internal capsule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Internal capsule, basal ganglia region. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So then. Sorry, what were her symptoms again? Hers were left sided. I mean, right sided. No, sorry, left sided. Her, she had left sided weakness. Okay, fair yep. enough. Left sided. Okay, and and confusion. Okay. Uh, let's see. So we looked at the CT, and then we look at ooh, that that is really proximal. So she has a right M1 cutoff. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Left side of symptoms, right M1, CTA, source images, aspect seven. I didn't know you, you could, this is, oh, I didn't know you could calculate the aspect off of CTA, but the, I've, I've never seen that done before. So question then, Lent, the lenticular striate arteries, the, those feed that feed that uh, basic thing, they come right off of that M1, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. well, then that makes may, that, that then, okay. I just had an aha moment. So yeah. let me <laughs> okay. um, pull up that image again. Because I, for me, things click when I see it. So let me just pull it up again. Mm. So, oh, come on. I'm getting too many ads. Too many ads, but I'll pull it up. Let me just Google it. Yeah, so you see here? Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. This, oh, this is M1. And then once we get past the basal ganglia, then, then we get into M2. And then once mm -hmm. we get further along, we have M3, M4. Perfect. Here's a better, that's a video. Let's use a better image. Oh, here we go. Here's a better image. Oh, that's a really good image. Oh, here it is. So we have M1 and then lentil striate, striatal arteries. Then after the basal ganglia, then we have M2. This is just probably showing places for aneurysm. That's different, different talk. Okay, cool. So now we get into the cases continued. So they gave the patient TPA within 66 minutes after onset. Patient was taken to angio where the right MA cutoff was confirmed. They do bronchectomy, complete recanalization, patient discharge to rehab. Ooh, awesome. So let's practice our blood vessels. So we know this is the internal carotid. This the end theater. Yep. And then this. Oh. Would that be the second MCA as well? No. Oh. Like mm. the, like, no, like left and right MCA? Or? This should be, this should be the ICA. Or sorry, ACA. Because MCA goes lateral and then medial is the ACA. We just, we're okay. just not seeing the other side. Sorry. Okay. So this is kind of, would this be more of like a sagittal view or? 
No, this is to me lateral. They just have an injecting contrast into the other artery to where you see the other ACA. Okay. I think this is just the, the right side and we're just seeing the right side. That's my guess. And then here we, this looks like the ICA again. Yeah. So this ICA, then this is the MCA. This is ACA. ACA. And okay. then I think we're, we're seeing this is ICA. And then this is the MCA on the left side. And then we're seeing AC on the right, on the left oh, side. Okay. And then this is where they join together. Coming up. Okay. I think the big takeaway is there's a lot of spaghetti here. <laughs> now, now I want spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> There's not as much here. I see. yeah, exactly, and that's where that and it makes sense. That makes sense because it's an M one cutoff. So of course now you and you do the you know surgical procedure and boom, it's now all the vessels are wide open. So yeah, awesome, awesome. So then I will clear this and let's see. Awesome. We are finished with that. Nice that. work. Fabulous. Let's, oops, oops, oops. Okay. So let me, I'm going to see. Um, I have some other, let me just pull up some other things we could do. Let's see. Some of these are more like vignette style, step two, step three style type questions. So let me find some of those since we just did some heavy duty cases, cases. Actually, I think this will be fun since you mentioned that you, uh, mm, no, let's not do that one. Let's do some questions. Do some free questions. Okay, let's do this one. This sounds fun. This one looks fun. And these are just some like fact questions. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Awesome. And this is readily available online. So let's see roughly what proportion of all strokes are ischemic rather than hemorrhagic? I would say 75, right? What? I'm, I'm, I'm eyeballing 75%. Yeah, me too. Awesome. What, roughly what proportion of ischemic stroke is due ooh, to carotid stenosis? Ooh. This ooh, this is a phone a friend. I, I'm going to say either, man, this is tough. Okay. It's either, I feel like it's either five or 20%. Can we yeah. narrow it down to those two? Okay. Yeah, that's let's what I was seeing. Let's, let's go. I think it's 20. 20. Yeah. Cool. I like that. And then, oh, it won't let me. I'm gonna scroll down, but we'll remember our answers. Um, okay. Let me get off this. Ooh. How many people? <laughs> how many people worldwide? Let me just make this smaller, so we can fit. Oh. How many people? Let's see, if we can fit. Okay, awesome. We can fit all the questions on. How many people worldwide each year have a stroke? That I would be guessing. I have no idea. Uh, this is a complete wild guess. I, I just, let's just do like 25 million, whatever. Awesome. I don't know. Either 25 or 30. Uh, that, that's just a complete wild guess. I would just guess the middle. How many, oh, how many deaths worldwide are due to stroke? Um, you one, can take this one. 
high morbidity, high mortality. Mm, let's do 10. That's a lot. 50%. Let's do this. Yeah. I was going to say either 1.5 or 5. I'm like, come to my. So they say, you know, our, our mortality is getting better, but our morbidity is patients are living longer. Which mm -hmm. I'm just guessing. But we're all learning. Okay. Let me get back. Oh, um, I don't know how to switch from eraser. Oh, come on. Okay, awesome. And people who have had a stroke or TIA, what is the subsequent risk of stroke? Ooh. Wow. That, it, I, wild guess A. About 30% of patients have a stroke in the first year and about, mm, Or is I, that too high? Yeah, I would guess this. Okay, I like it. And you're not expected to know this. This is more like PGY3, PGY4, maybe a little bit of fellow, fellowship level. So this is just for funsies. Okay. Which of the following best reflects the evidence of the value of specialist stroke units or team compared with conventional care? What do you so think? Definitely not A, okay. Specialist care reduces the risk of the effort to be failing in child for long fall on that risk of also reducing. For some reason, I guess I just maybe see patient. Yep, that's what I would say too. Sounds like answer is here. <laughs> <laughs> and then for seven, which of the following best reflects the evidence of the benefits of aspirin and acute stroke? Let's oh, switch. the controversial aspirin. Okay. So we know we know it's not C because it's yeah, A2. definitely not with AFib. You want right. to come in. Yeah. What's the in old versus young patients, female versus male? I, I'm just gonna go with B. Yeah, me too. Cool. So let's see how we did. So for one, oh, there's still more. Oh, there's 10 questions. Okay. Uh, which of the following groups who had mild, uh, most likely been from carotid? Oh, look, we just looked this one up. Wait, which of the following groups? Oh, sorry, there's a lot of. The, the I'm sorry, purpose. let me. Let me <laughs> we, we've memorized our answers, so we're good. <laughs> oh, geez. I thought that was going to help. I didn't think this through. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll have our answers memorized. I'm sure we'll memorize. Yeah. Them. Let me just clear this. Okay, which of the following groups of patients who have had symptoms due to carotid stenosis is most likely to benefit from carotid and arachne? Oh! Ooh, wait. What do you so, think? Oh, gosh. Okay. So, what is, okay, it's either got to be the, one of the last two, 50 to 670. So, which of the following groups do carotid? most likely to benefit. So I guess then the last one. Yeah, that's, yeah, because I mean, we read- The higher stenosis, the, like this one is like most likely getting surgery, 50 to 69 is like, hey, really think about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which of the following neuroprotective agents has been proven in studies to significantly improve clinical outcomes of stroke? Oh. Personally, I haven't heard of Lubelzol or Gavistenol. I've never heard of those. Newer protective. And yeah, and I haven't heard so, of those. Yeah, so I, I would have to say, well, so the thing is, so let's just then answer what is proven. So that would be after an acute stroke, we have what? We have our statins that are mandatory. We have, um, we have our anticoag like our Coumadin or, or whatever type of anticoagulant of choice, whether it be our um, DOAC, NOAC, whatever, uh, Coumadin, right? Because that's like mandatory. And then like anything else? Like that's like proven? No. Okay. Yeah, so there's that. Awesome. And then last but not least, we have of secondary prevention is definitely a statin for 10. Awesome. Cool. So let's see how we did. So number one, I'm going to just I'm gonna figure out this. So number one, we said 75, 85, 
uh, percent of. We did say 75. Girls. Yep. Yeah, we did say that. Okay. Then number two, we said 20%. That's what, yeah, yeah that's what we, we said. Did. Okay. okay. <laughs> number three, 15, that's a lot of people. 15 million? That was the middle one, right? We, oh. Um, oh, I think we did. No, did you did say. 15. No, I think we said 5.5, no. 5, 5, but that's all good. I would. No, that's a different question. That's a different question. The five point five is a different question. You have fifteen million for number three, and then five point five for number four. Oh, what did we say for number? But I think we, we said, said we said twenty five. Did we say twenty five? Okay. Yeah. Well, and then what did we say for the five point five? Or did we say what five point five? Or did oh, we, we did say five point five. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Okay, so let's. <laughs> So let's see, that's a lot of people. So in the recent stroke estimated in 2002 that 15 million people had a stroke, five of whom were left disabled. Okay, 15 million, that's a lot of people. So about a third of the people who've had a stroke are disabled. And then, and then there's, a, and then about another third actually died from their stroke. Okay, so mm. third and third, well, that's in 2002. So I'm assuming that, um, Okay, about 10% of people will have a stroke in their first year and 5% after. Yeah, we did that. We said this one. Yeah. 10%, yeah. 5%. Mm -hmm. The middle one, yeah. Um, specialists can reduce the risk of death or dependency at one year, and trials with longer follow up were also reduced. Yeah, that's what we said. Basically, that's why we're shipping people to comprehensive stroke centers. Exactly. Cool. The benefit, yeah, the beneficial effect a reduction in risk of death is similar to old versus young, female versus oh, oh and we those didn't pick this one. Oh, wow. Let's see what they have to say. Benefit. This is in regard to aspirin, right? Yeah. From that benefit of aspirin reduced to death. Wow. So basically, aspirin does not discriminate based on age, gender, huh. or a fibby or not a fibby. Well, we don't give people. We huh, that's interesting. But we but don't. That, this, this has got to be an old study because there's, yeah. there's been so much like 2000. That's a study 20 plus years ago. Yeah. Hmm. I'll have to. Um, that's 20 years. That's 22 years ago. Yeah. Well, we'll get. We'll, we can. We'll keep doing more stroke questions, and I'm sure it'll become clearer because I don't, I know we definitely anticoagulate. Yeah, but the aspirin with the AFib really kills me. I mean, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a bit, that's interesting. Yeah, maybe before, you know, maybe it's a new change in the guidelines. And look, we, we got, uh, we did pretty well. We missed two patients. with 70% more since notice were inclusion. So there we got that one right. Nine, none of the above. Hey, we got 80%. It's not and bad. We <laughs> can you take lot. my can you take all my board exam? <laughs> hey, this is good. And this is like some random paper. And by just by going through those cases, you know, we're, you know, we were able to answer yeah. the questions together. So let me um let me look through one more source that I saw that has some fun questions that we could go through. And then whenever you have to leave, just let me know. I'm just doing these for funsies. Uh, this is what you do in your spare time. <laughs> what do I do in my spare time? This helps yeah. me study. Like I'm doing this because I need to know this stuff and it helps me study. <laughs> I love studying with people. Like if you ask me to sit down and read a book, I'm gonna do everything else but read that book, you know? <laughs> but if, if I'm reading a book because I'm prepping for a study group, then I'm gonna read the book. Yeah, yeah. So, let's see. It also helps if someone's Ooh. equally enthusiastic about it. So. Huh? It, it also helps if someone's equally enthusiastic about it though. Exactly. You know. Here's another uh, great resource uh, for questions. I just Googled free questions and this came up. So let's, um, will they give us the right answer? 
Well, we'll see. Which of the following is excluded from nervous system? Blah, 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 blah. What? Oh, I have no. Oh, this is some ICD. I have no what? idea. I mean, I, I, I mean, wow. Okay, uh, which of the is excluded from the nervous system disease? Oh, those, these are ICD-10 codes. We, I don't have to know that. Don't worry about it. That's ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> I think you might I would just skip. Is it cerebral infarct? Okay. But don't worry about it. That's coding stuff. Let's get down to the stuff that we have to know about. Okay. Which of the following is a classical symptom of a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Okay. Um, I know you can have like meningeal symptoms, seizures. Um, I'm going to say no to aphasia. Right? I was gonna because say, that's more ischemic. I was going to say, because like headache, headache, photophobia. Yeah. That's my guess. Let's see what they say. Like, I'm going to say no to B or D. Um, so I like C. I do like C because B and D are a little bit more on the ischemic side with like ah, the so sensory motor and stuff. But seizure is usually can lead, like that can be post bleed versus pre bleed. Yeah. Like, so I like photophobia because that's more of a meningeal irritation type of sign. Right? Yeah. And that's exactly what they said here. Great job. Oh. Yeah. Oh, look. <laughs> I didn't even know that. Cool. Yep. Great job. So then let's try it. So then let's see. What is the risk of stroke within seven days after TIA and vigils who sought treatment for event? Oh, Ooh. wow. Risk of stroke within seven days after TIA. Oh, I, I, well, I think it goes back to 20% again, right? Let's see what they have to say. The risk of ischemic stroke is dangerously high in a period following TIA, indicate that one half of strokes occur within the first 48 hours, and then five and 5% of the patients. Oh. oh, so it goes down. Okay, so cool. I want to sweat. I think I missed that. I, wait, so it's saying half of the. Wait, so if you have a TIA, research in your half is the same, occur with them. Okay, so what's this one half then? I'm, I'm confused. One half of subsequent O's occur within the first 48. I was just trying to understand. Right? Yeah, it's, it's worded weird. Research indicates that one half of subsequent strokes occur within the first 48 hours. So I guess of all the people that have a TIA, I read it as 50% of them will have a stroke in two days. But I could be wrong. And a oh. meta-analysis showed that 5% of patients who have TIA will have a stroke within seven days. The risk of stroke within three months is 10. Oh, don't worry about it. Just know that if you- I don't like that. <laughs> it's just no takeaway. If you have a TIA, it's a warning sign for stroke. Yeah, I, yeah. Oh, and you at least have five percent chance with those days. Number four, we tackled that a little bit. I think we kind of went to like that uh, Amaro Fugay. I can never say that with yeah. the changing monocular blindness. Yeah, but then yep. I'm like, That's you know, I, say. I like that. Let's do it. Amaurosis fugate. It's a French word. So let's see what they have to say. Any stroke, for instance, disturbance of the ipsilateral eye, although the most common neurological sign. Oh. Common folk neurological sign of TIA are sudden onset weakness, numbness, and tingling. Oh, okay. huh. So actually, it's so then it's D. Okay. Oh. That's fair. Good to know. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Which most individuals with stroke have recoverable penumbra tissue for at least how long after symptom onset? That's my guess. Yeah, I mean, I only think that only because of like that whole all place window. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, let's see um, what they have to say. These are hard questions. <laughs> oh, three hours. And there we go. Nice. Okay, an extreme stroke in the right anterior hemisphere would cause which to fall neurological defects. Oh, this is the this is the step three question right here. Okay, so no to ataxia. I do like aphasia. Um, 
Oh, wait, like anterior. Oh, oh, oh boy. Okay, because Atax is more cerebellar. Yep. Aphasia is a little bit more on like, if they're right-handed, they would be more on the left side. So like yep. left frontal left. So I'm gonna say no to aphasia. Nystagmus can be a little bit of like more occipital, right? More occipital lobe kind of. Well, or also so, parietal. Or? So this, you're thinking for occipital, it's gonna be like the optic nerve because of the optic tracts and how that, but for nystagmus, that's more so like extra ocular movements, muscles, Oh, um, that's my so, guess. But, but then remember what Gabriela taught visual neglect. Remember what, yeah, Gabriela taught us yesterday. So, what do you think? The frontal eye. So, let's do D then. Yeah. Left interior. Yep. Right visual field deficit. Woo! I like this. Uh, I'm going to copy this. <laughs> That is, that's a nice and i'm a big chart person so this is that's a nice chart I'm gonna i like that that is a nice they love localization on uh on the step exams Okay. Which of the following part, which of the following is part of the posterior circulation of the brain? Oh no. You got this. I mean, <laughs> posterior circulation. Um, can we say no to A? Yes. Um, I guess I do like B. Me too. I don't think C because C goes A to the M to. I'm gonna say no to C. I think posterior communicating is supposed to be like a um a trick one. So, so I'm gonna go with B. Yeah, me too. But I thought posterior communicating P com P com. That's what why would they do that? Hmm. Yeah, so I feel like that. I'm like, are they trying to trick me? Like. Because it, it says posterior communicating, meaning it does communicate with is it is with the PCA. Oh, so. so it's part of the posterior and the anterior. Let's see. I feel like they're trying to trick me. I don't know. I don't like that. <laughs> okay. Well, here we go. Composed. Yeah. Oh, I think you're right. Good call. Yeah, that that's a tricky one. But which one is what? Which one is most definitely part of the posterior? Without yeah, and so. Yeah, without that, a new B was. So awesome. So posterior uh, vertebral basilar posterior cerebellar supplies. And it looks like the posterior communicating artery connects the posterior circulation to the anterior circulation. Yeah. That's tricky. Right. Yeah. Ooh most, ooh, most common cause of embolic stroke. I mean, I smell AFib. Yes, and I would agree with you. See what they say. Yep, AFib. Beautiful. Is and valvular the next one? I wonder. Would see. that be second? The valvular patients with patients valvular. with valvular thrombi from endocarditis or prosthetic valves. Mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Like what the? Let's see what this says. What the hierarchy is. Mm. We can look. I'll send this to you to see if it says it in there. At three months after a stroke, what percentage of stroke survivors need long term care? Well, we said we mentioned that like a third walk out of their clean slate, another third dies, and another third is, you know, has, has high disability. So that's only when I like 20%, but I would say at three months. I think it's a high number. 
I would say either 40 or 60, just be, I would say at three months after a stroke, what percentage of strokes survivors? So of the people that survive, so then we would have to knock out. So if all the people that have oh. a stroke, one third of them die, so they're not going to be oh. included. You're right. I re, See, reading is fundamental. You're so right of the survivors. We're not even talking of the other two thirds. We're literally just focused on this, of the survivors, which is of the one third. Then what of them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would say it's going like, to be let I like 40 then. 40? Okay. Mm. Let's see. I'm going to go with 60, but let's see what they say. So approximately, okay. and they, they, I knew this would be About 20%. Okay. Oh, wow. At three months, approximately 20% depend on, oh, survivors depend. Oh, neat. See, I was, I read short-term care. See, oh. <laughs> the, like you talked about, read the question. They didn't say short-term care. They said long-term. Well, there we go. And that's a good strategy on board. Like step exam, like read the prompt because you're reading this so quickly. Like, oh, you switch words here and there. Yeah. Oh, the average age at time of ischemic stroke. What do you think? Um, so I'm going to say not D. I'm going to, I like A. Yeah, that sounds good. Looks like it's uh, C. Uh, Again, these C. questions, these are not, these are very nitpicky. So these are just for fun these. But I'll let you know which uh, which questions are like okay you will see like you will see localization on your step step exam. According to some American Heart Statistics, which of the following has the highest prevalence of stroke? Is it is it black? Yeah. Oh wait, am I? Oh, stroke prevalence. This is American Indian Alaskan. Oh. Stroke prevalence. Oh non. Oh, so oh. it's native Native Indian Native American. It really depends on what source you read, because there are many sources that say Blacks, African Americans. So yeah, because I'm like, I feel like American Indian, unfortunately, you know, it's sadly it's often not talked about. So yeah, um, it, it really it depends on what source you read. Yeah. Oh, here's a good one. Which of the following has the most evidence as a risk factor for ischemic stroke? This is a more question. Yeah, yeah, this one hypertension. Yeah. Nice. For aneurysms as well, I believe hypertension is the number one risk factor. Yep. And then... For, or for aneurysm rupture, I meant... Or, yeah. Oh, so this is a good question. From a... For step three, they loved those... Uh, like, you know how you get preventative medicine? If you have, like, you know, if you're a female greater than 30, you need to go mm -hmm. get, like, a mammogram. Like, so... Yeah. They love so asking these questions on step three. Ooh, um, according to how often she needs them. Ooh, this one's tough. I'm just going to say every three to six months. <laughs> uh, this is That's actually often. pretty normal. Oh, I'm sorry. I just realized what blood pressure we're talking. See, I didn't even read it. I, I just saw hypertension and I was like, oh. So for that one, just, hmm, that one's probably every two or, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what I would guess. Yeah, yep. I just realized I didn't even bother to look at the blood pressure. I just saw, oh, for hypertension, what do you do? Okay, yeah. What percentage of patients? Awesome. Well, it's 255, and these are just fun questions. Um, we can always pick, pick these up later, or I can send them to you and just look through them. Um, but thanks for studying with me. Yeah, it's been fun. Till next time, it has really, this is always good stuff. And I like to be ahead of the game, so. Well, you <laughs> so are like nice. three years ahead of the game, so keep it up. Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So, and if there's, very, very nice. If there's anything that you want to talk through or, you know, study, just send me a message and we can add it. I can look for cases and we can add it to the, you know, to our schedule. To the agenda. Absolutely. That is awesome. Thank you so, so much. Cool. Thank you. I'm going to stop recording. How do I stop this recording? Uh, oh, I got to stop sharing. Then am I still recording? Oh.